Thank you, that's very nice. It's, uh, it's great to be here. I was, when I walked in this room, I was wondering how why they have the singing arrangements. I think it's based on the scale of Frank's favorites in the building. If you're on Frank's favorite, you sit in the front, if you're not in the back, is that the idea? <laughs> how, how do you arrange this? I thought all Australia was uh, even Italian society, not that, but. Okay, so if you guys want to come, there are some seats, seriously. And uh, uh, that was very nice to, to hear uh, the minister talk about a lot of autonomy, different kind of things. So before I get started, I was wondering how many of you set a phone, a Nokia phone? Nokia? You have a Nokia? Are you using it? I'm, I currently use a Nokia phone. You can have one. That's very rare, right? It's a, if I ask that question about five years ago, that's probably half of the room, right? Uh, and Motorola? Motorola? So they, I was uh, doing some research yesterday called the death of Nokia. If you type the death of Nokia, you can find a lot of interesting story about it. How, who killed Nokia? Really, basically. Apple didn't kill Nokia, killed Nokia. Uh, because Nokia actually came up with a smartphone idea far earlier than Apple. And Nokia had something called App Store. If they wanted the Apple Store, that would be five, six years ahead of Apple. Why did they do it? Because they were very successful at doing something else. So they were not getting to doing something that's less successful. So this is called the curse of success. When you are very successful, it's very dangerous. This goes to all the great schools in Victoria, okay. So if you are great, yeah, that's something interesting. The same thing happened to Kodak. Remember Kodak? Who would be taking picture without film? You know, that was the idea. So the, the, they invented a digital camera, but they was not interesting to them at that time. So, so this is, I think, the, the first big thing I would like to, to talk about. Can I have the slides up? Oh, these are nice now. Uh, and so, uh, by the way, if you want to download the slides, uh, all the slides I have is really up there on my website. Some of them, I, it's not there, and you can email me because I can just put up there copyrighted materials by others. You know, I, I can you know, privately share with you, not in public. And then uh, if you feel, feel like tweeting, you can follow, you know, hashtag me or whatever me, you know, do whatever. Uh, or if you want to, more information, you can email me. So when I talk about the death of uh, of those technologies, I know a lot of times when we are in one mode, we keep doing the same thing until it dies. Then it will be too late for us to reverse. It will be too late. Then came along you know, Apple computers, then we have uh, Samsung. You know, you know Samsung. What's the difference between Samsung and Nokia? Or why is dead? Why is alive? Of course, that's a big difference. But there's another difference. Samsung is trying to make a new paradigm better. So like with the iPhone is more the children of the iPod, not a phone. And Nokia was trying to make a phone add an iPod to it. So that was an old paradigm. So they, they kept making the dumb phones smarter. That was trying to do. And these guys are trying to make smartphones smarter. So that's different thing. So Samsung was really basically beating Apple in terms of pricing. But they are you know, improving a different paradigm. It's a different uh, view of, of thinking. This is what I think education faces all the time. You know, when, when you are doing great as a school, as a national system, we may have to reflect. So currently, the globally speaking, you know, we call the globally successful educational system are experiencing the curse of success. The Asian systems, you know, the Finland, not in Finland, the Finnish system. If you go, I just did a study for the Mitchell Institute of Victoria University, which we're going to release some of the preliminary findings in about uh, two weeks uh, here. I'll be, I'll be back in Melbourne again. I enjoy the winter here, it's nice. And, uh, and so, and we were just, I was just in Korea, Singapore, uh, Shanghai, uh, and the Hong Kong. And you know, these systems, that whatever showed them to be great in international uh, assessment, and they're actually having a hard time to get out of it because they have that curse. So in a school, as a teacher, we do the same thing, right? If we know we're great at producing Nakhlan scores or some other results, we will keep doing the same thing. But that may not work anymore. Because we run into new technologies, that's very transformative. By the way, I have this great good fortune to visit many Victoria schools. I've been here, I've been visiting here almost every year for the last decade. So I know a lot of good friends, a lot of schools there. You guys have really good schools, so this is a, a, 
I'm talking about not about your school. You guys will find some other schools in Tasmania and New Zealand. Okay. <laughs> All my advice today does not apply to you. Okay. You just say no. Just apply to South Australia, maybe Queensland, maybe somebody else. Okay. So let's have some. I mean, I would advise you to do some thinking. Do you guys know what this is? It's, oh, good. It's a Google car. Very few people know what this Google car is, but it's coming to a street near you. Okay. Uh, England actually is going to allow driverless cars on the streets next year. California already allows them on, on the road. So this is a car that does not need a driver. That's very simple. It does not need a driver. So there is no, if you step into this car, you will find there's no steering wheel because nobody is there to steer, to control. There's no uh, a gas pedal. There's no brake in, in this car. So this car is going to come. It's going to arrive. Now ask yourself this question, what kind of problems will no longer be problems in the future? You know, sometimes we're, we're so immersed in the problems, we solve big problems, but those problems, maybe sometimes in, I learned all my lessons that there are no problems that's so big you cannot run away from. So you always have to run away from problems. If you wait long enough, they'll solve themselves or they will disappear. Okay. So what kind of problems will this disappear and what new problems will this create? Anybody, can you think about this? I run this exercise first about three, two months ago in Tasmania. I got very interesting answers in Tasmania. Let's see if Victoria can compete with them. <laughs> Any, uh, what, what kind of problems will disappear? What, yes? DUIs. That's always a male uh, kind of answer. You know, <laughs> men always came with the first one. I can drink and drive now. You know, so I will never be arrested for doing that. Okay, that's so good. Okay, all right, that's true. Yes, please. Bad drivers. Bad drivers. Everybody will be equalized. So driving skill will no longer distinguish you as a person, right? So you're not curse the bad Asian drivers anymore, the Chinese, you know? <laughs> yeah, so that, that's a, what's also, you know, kind of racial problem. And it's very true, so it's not, you know, the, the, so driving skills, how good you are at that, you cannot, there's no bragging rights about that anymore. So that's, that's good. Kids will drive them, they won't. They will get in a car driven by Google to school, right? So you can put your, you know, your infant, your babies, your one year old, and they will just walk to school. <laughs> so in more secondary schools, you won't have that problem. Primary schools will be seeing two year olds come walking to class on their own, right? So that's a lot of extra time for parents. How, anything else? It, it will decrease the revenue for the state because there will be no traffic infringements. They will, they will, you, we don't need. But there will be no traffic fines. So that, that's right. So we don't need. For the state. That's why decreased cost for we won't have need so many police traffic police, right? That's a, if you're studying to be a police, forget about it. That's no longer going to work, right? Is that and if driving skills is no longer a problem, we don't need drivers' education, right? And actually, that's going to reduce uh, parental uh, child parent problems. I was I've been trying to teach my daughter how to drive. She's 15, 16. How hard it is to teach her own children to drive? I mean, it's very emotional, charging. So I, that would be good for me. Better relationship with your kids. That's uh, that, that's, that's good. Anything else? Yes, please. Uh, fewer accidents. Fewer. Yeah, that's that's right. Yes. More time. More time. What do you do with the time? I mean, imagine now as school principals, you drive to school. And now, you, uh, you will be arrested for talking on your phone, right? Now, that's not a problem. Feel free talking on your phone, texting, doing work, and all those. Uh, so, there's a lot of some other people post, is it? perhaps in the future, we don't need only car. Because you're punching, the, you, we, we, today car ownership has become a cultural fact. But how often do you actually use the car? On, on every day, you can use for less than two hours. Most of the time, it lies there, it's wasted, right? Some, some of them. And it becomes a sta status symbol, a car, right? You buy the car not because it drives, because it looks good, feels good. The whole car industry actually has been driven by the color, the model, and the changes, all this. Most of them need this stuff. So if Google car or any other car, Google is not the only one who's making this car. Basically, book as a service. Right, they tap in and comes in at 9 o'clock, pick you up, drop you off, and goes to a place to find a nice place to park itself and come back or maybe go to some other place. You don't need to own a car. So cars become a service. Then you have a different insurance. 
So the cards will be different. So what? These are all the, some of the possibilities people are debating right now. Then, of course, you have this, this issue about uh, what, now with the extra time, you talk about this one. I need a car. So what kind of new problems might create? Well, problems is that, you know, actually, like opportunities too, new opportunities. So if you are, I think a lot more people will be building bars, you know, they'll be designing bars and a car will be a big business. <laughs> right, don't you think? I, I think so. That's a, a better internet service in a car will be good. And uh, then uh, how about uh, if we have to think about, um, you know, we'll lose a lot of jobs. The drive, taxi drivers, we won't need them. Limousine drivers, all the car services, uh, even like uh, traffic lights, makers, engineers in the whole domain, we won't need them. But we need, we need more, a lot more designers, not more entertainers. You know, uh, you know. We get to very interesting things. So, so industries like this, um, industrial changes like a Google car, like Nokia, like everything else, they come and they transform. But not all the time. In, in human society, we don't really experience massive transformations all the time. But when massive transportations, uh, uh, transformations come, they always redefine the value of talents. They redefine the value of your products. So as school leaders, we, I think today we'd like to discuss with you about what kind of products are we making in our children, uh, are we making. You know, when, uh, when the minister was talking about you want to be a top tier school system, top tier in what? That's always the question, was it top tier in what? Yeah, it's, because right now, I, I think a lot of people are talking, our performance is going up, our outcome is going up, but measured by what? So that you want to become effective, you want to become proficient, you want to become great, but great in doing what? That's the kind of things. I think it has to do with how we define the product. In our schools today, I don't know how you measure. Internationally, we measure our school system by International tests like the PISA. Everybody knows the PISA. Yeah. Everybody knows. Okay, and, you know, and so or TIMS or, or some other international assessments. We we'll always show that. And and by the way, Australia, actually, you guys are not bad. Australia is not that bad. I don't know why you worry about it. It's not. It's, you're pretty good. You know, just uh, and uh, but <coughs> your schools now. I think. Uh, are you still doing the NAPTA? I see, so everyone still held accountable for the NAPTA? Somehow, yes. so, so that's how we measure. So we're assuming whatever the PISA measures, whatever NAPTA measures, matter. We're assuming it matter, right? Do they really matter? That's the question. Like we call driving skills, right? You know, driving skills mattered before when we need drivers. Today, it may not matter. Uh, another you know, story I just related to this one. I, I was born in a little village in China, in southwest uh, uh, China, Sichuan province. I was born to be a, a farmer in my village. And apparently, as you can tell, I was actually talking to my, my family last week, I said that I am the uh, worst failure in my village. I am a completely failed peasant. <laughs> Didn't work. Didn't work for me. Seriously, that, that's it. If you go to that village in terms of being a peasant, being a farmer, I did not acquire the skills. I couldn't do any of those things. Thank God there is Melbourne that I can come here. You know. it's, uh, so so that, that was another thing. So what's valuable at one time may become less valuable at another time. What's valuable in one place may become less valuable in other places. So Google Car, the death of the death of Nokia, and the rise of Kim Kardashian. That's another to think about. Yes, you know, you know Kardashian? She was here three years ago. She stayed in one of the hotels here. It's the hotel you're staying in, you know, so it's, you're, you're proud, you can find her room. Maybe something's still left in the room. And uh, uh, I, 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 as soon as the real I saw her with Andy Hargreaves, and we were in the elevator, and she was, Outside, and you know, she was trying to get in, and then outside, a bunch of kids, children, were hanging out there. And I so said, they were all there for Kim Kardashian. So I'm writing, you know, I just talked to my daughter, and uh, my daughter is 16, as I told you, and she just turned 16 last week, and I said, Who is this Kardashian person? My daughter said, She's a celebrity. So I said, Well, celebrity for what? She said, Nothing. <laughs> Kardashian is. Uh, Famous for being well known, that's that's basically her, her, her big thing. And I'm just wondering, but somehow 
she has someone's way to pay for her to travel to Australia. She must be worth something. Uh, she must be worth. So she's. So she must her. She must be offering something other people value. And what is that? Why the talent has risen to be valuable? And this is quite interesting. Most people actually have argued with because they don't like Kardashian. And I don't like her either, honestly. I can't even find a picture of her that's decent enough to show you. You know, this is very hard to find on this one. It's just, uh, you know, it's one of the few photos you can find online that can be shown to principals. You are serious people, you know. So. <laughs> but then, if you look at her, what does she offer? Why is she valuable in that sense? That, well, she's valuable. Actually, it's very simple thing. She provides some kind of some kind of satisfaction to a very small fraction of people. We have entered a different age, as a new age. She would have been useless in my village, <laughs> as I was. You know, think about that. Right now, she is useful somehow here in more developed countries. Why? So all of this is, is you know, interesting. Comes down to some other. Phenomena I want to show you as well. Think about, you know, we had a lot of people working on these places, and now they're all gone. Did you notice that? So you think about this. Technology makes things disappear, then they make things appear. So let's analyze this whole thing. What happened, and how this is going to affect our schools? Well, what happened is this: I mean, over the last 30 years. Our society has come through massive transformation, but we have not had time to think about it. We have not had time to think. School continues to produce the same products. That's why you're measured by PISA, how well you score, you know, what on those math and science, you measure math plan, you still focus on numerous and numerous you think these are going to be great skills. But are they really going to be helping us? So what has changed? So we've been trying to do better. We're trying to do better, but not necessarily doing, knowing doing better at what. So I call most of our education reforms, including that in Australia and US and uh, in the UK, is trying to do the wrong thing more right. Okay, trying to do the wrong thing more right. And I'll talk about what we're trying to do. Well, if you look at Australia, what we've been trying to do over the last 30 years, your big shift is national curriculum. A big shift is about national assessment. A big shift is about uh, holding schools more accountable to some basic scores. You know, that's the kind of things we're trying to do. Now, what has changed, which is not recognized? So if we treat this as Google Car, if we spend some time sitting down to talk about how does globalization affect our students, affect what we should do in, in school, affect skills and knowledge and talents. <coughs> This is a 2005, I think, that came out of this book, Thomas Friedman book. Many of you already know this book, The, the World is Flat. Basically, it talks about globalization version 3. Globalization version 3 is something very simple. That is, we have uh, become, the, the globe has become tiny, <coughs> tiny. That is, we truly have become global village. That the time and effort it takes to cross distance has been dramatically reduced. It all matters very little now. So how does that affect our students or affect our jobs, or the value of our talents, skills, and knowledge? How does it affect that? It's very simple. One thing, offshoring and outsourcing. Because the, the transaction cost is so low, you can send the jobs anywhere. And if, like, for example, in Australia lost its uh, textile jobs, shoemaking jobs, Commercial electronics, all of this is 1970s. We sent to, we first sent to Taiwan, Singapore, Thailand, and now those countries sent to China. China now is sending those jobs to Vietnam, Vietnam to Cambodia, and Cambodia to Bangladesh. That's shifted. Then you send out over advanced jobs over to other countries. Now you are talking about banking and financing. That's been done in China, been done in India. So that's the whole shift. Means jobs. Skills, if they can be acquired cheaper, that cost less in other places, and that job will go there. So as edu educators, you have to think about, are you equipping your students with skills and knowledge and talents that cannot be acquired 
in other places at lower cost. So that's why I've always wondered about Australia's uh, kind of uh, crazy fascination with the pizza stores. Okay? Even Australian students acquired the talent or skills to score as high as Shanghai. You can even surpass Shanghai. You would have lost in terms of, in, in that regard because of globalization. Simply means that to cultivate the same skills, you would have cost more. In Victoria, well, thank God, you got $400 million. Well, what are you doing with $400 million? So that's goes to dinner tonight, right? right? That's, a, that's a $400 million. Okay. But on average, in Victoria, I would have bet for 12 years of your students in your system, the cost would be $100,000. $100,000 in Victoria. That's an average. US is about $115,000. Ji Shanghai, they would have spent maybe $10,000 over 10 years. So you spend 10 times more to acquire the same knowledge and skills. Which employer would pay you 10 times more for that just because you're Australian and you look nice? That won't work. So that's a simple logic. I'm not talking about education is only for the purpose of economical things, but economical viability is definitely a major factor to think about education. So that's the goal you have to think about. So what skills can do that? Then we have, we see another thing, two big factor change, two big changes. Globalization, another big change is we call, we are entering the second machine age. Feel free, you can read this book, it just came out of uh, MIT, two professors. The second machine age, what is the second machine age? It is in contrast to the first machine age. The first machine age, was the one that driven by the steam engine. You know, the industrial revolution started by the steam engine. That was now the second machine age is driven by digital technology. What does digital technology do? It deals with a lot of our human cognitive functions. It replaces human cognitive functions. Remember, education is to improve our cognitive functions, to improve our skills. So that this force you have uh, Google cars. Technology replacing drivers, right? Technology replacing, as I was showing you, replacing workers here. Technology replacing uh, bank terrors. Technology replacing airline workers. You notice all of those things? And technology replacing accountants. Technology replacing lawyers. So all of those kind of things. So a lot of the cognitive jobs Okay. So now, how are you cultivating skills and knowledge that will not be replaced by machines? And by the way, almost everything, if every task, if you can parse the task into steps, if you can describe the step-by-step -step things, it will be automated. It can be and it will be automated. That's why we're automating very complex tasks now. So if it's cognitively procedural, how can we do that? How can we compete with machines? So that's the challenge for most developed countries. What are we going to do with this? We're losing a lot of middle class jobs in different countries. This is the, the US data. I could not find Australian data for this, but I gather it will be very similar to this. Since the 1970s in the US, we've seen the shrinking of the middle class. The shrinking of the middle class, that is the middle income group is shrinking, then we have a bipolar growth of the top income and bottom income. And this is fairly dangerous to a society. When you have say the middle class, the bedrock of democracy disappear, then you are going to be in trouble. So what happened in, in this process? You can blame social policy, it's not a policy problem, it's because we have been losing the traditional middle class jobs to other places. The traditional middle class jobs, you know, as I was showing you, the accountants, the lawyers, the people working on assembly lines, you make it those, they were middle class jobs. They were either outsourced or they are being replaced by machines. So now the question is, what kind of talents well, do we have to cultivate in the future? This, so you look around this one, this is the 
The 200 years of job change. 200 years. This is, uh, again, in developed countries. Uh, agriculture almost to nothing. Agriculture. That's actually, I'm very happy I am a failed peasant. They won't do anything for me anyway. And so they actually can go to agriculture. Farmers, not farmers anymore. They use precision agriculture technology. You notice that they use GPS to plow. They use very good sensor to send message about uh, this plant need nitrogen, this plant need water. They're very high tech stuff. That's why they produce a lot more food, you know, with fewer people. And this industry got replaced by the working class around the 1870s. That's what we call industrial revolution. And then people become employees to work for somebody else. That's how it happens. So we've been doing that. And now that work is done, it's actually declining since 1960s, 70s. You know, that's what we call the outsourcing and automation. So today, what's on the rise, we say the two groups. The creative group is the high income group. And the service sector is the low income group. That's what we're saying this whole and this corresponds very well to our already our educational problem. Our educational problem is seen, globally speaking, we're having a lot of, lot of university graduates not finding jobs. This is, that's, that's why it disappeared. Our, in, in Australia, I think you read this, but a few weeks ago, Australia's youth unemployment hit a 12 year high. Youth unemployment. Remember, they were actually, they were in your school. Remember, they were, you're actually, Australia's secondary education is getting better and better. But these kids are not getting, university students are not getting jobs. This is not only for Australia, this is actually China. China graduates 7 million college students a year. I can guarantee you most of them do not actually have a job. Uh, that's a, and the US too, the US we got 50% of our recent college graduates have no jobs. Uh, unemployed or underemployed, again, the same Australia. Almost all the different, actually, today in the world, we have the best educated of bartenders and coffee makers. They are unemployed. It's a, so the, this is the, the issue we have. So our students, basically, traditional middle class have disappeared. Traditional schools do not work anymore. And Google, you speak on Google, Google now employs about 14% of its employees today have no college degree. Google actually is they do not automatically bring your college degree from Harvard as guaranteed. So no, we want to say, so your college degree only means you've been a good student, nothing else. And we don't need good students. We need different kind of workers. So that's, that's what, what Google is talking about. Google actually goes around the world trying to find talents online. They, they, they have their HR department do not wait for you to submit resume. They hunt people. If you're good in anywhere you are, if you've done something interesting, they'll try to talk to you. No matter how old or how young you are. So that's the kind of new, new, new tech, new situation we face. So what has gone wrong in, in basic education? And we have not been reflecting. So what has gone wrong is this. It is we have been trying to fix an an old education paradigm that has apparently become outdated. If you look at this paradigm, some of you have seen this already. I, I, I came up with this one book a few years, years ago in my book. So this is what most of our schools today are judged by. Most of our national educational systems are evaluated based on this. This is a, we start by describing the skills and knowledge children should acquire. That's what your curriculum is about. The Victoria curriculum, the national Australian curriculum is about you, you describe a set of knowledge and skills that children should have. We call them employable or valuable skills. That's necessary for you to live in the society. Remember that's, so we prescribe that by some kind of authority and then we verify that by exams. So you have not now you have other assessment from those things. So it's all about making sure every child acquires the skills, knowledge that we believe they should have. That's what we try to do. That was we, we want to do that thing. And that model no longer works. So this is, a, I call this, this kind of just in case model. We think in the future this job will exist and you should know the skills and you should do this whole thing. So this model, you can see this, is also a very much of a 
our homogenization model, we reduce diversity. We know our children are different. We know our children have different strengths. We know they have different talents. But we normally don't care about that. We don't care. And also we know we have a human beings that's created so much knowledge in different areas, we don't care. So they come to our school, this is deficit model. We judge it to say, if you happen to be good at what we think is important, you are considered the gifted and talented students. But if your area of interest and talent happens to be beyond those areas, we send you to the special education group. Right? That, that's how we, how we do it. We fix deficit. We look at you, how well are you at meeting what I need? And then we look at schools, look at the national systems. And say, how well are you making sure your children is learning what other people think are important? Or all of our groups right now are doing this. Every class we do this, and a teacher says, oh, I'm assessing you, have you mastered what I want you to learn? We care very little about what students know about the whole process. So we're fixing deficit, not capitalized on strength. And the systems that have done the best so far is called the Nokia success. The Asian system, the Shanghai, the Singapore, China, they're all very good at doing this. Now this is, a, this is called, um, I call this a sausage making process. Because we don't like bacon, we don't like hamburger, we just want sausage. So everybody has to become a sausage. I will judge you as, you know, I always think about gifts and does you know, kind of steak is great. Prime rib, you know, we had was good. But prime rib is a horrible piece of sausage, I mean sausage, right? Because it's, it judge one thing by another. So this is how we traditionally do, and our education reform has been trying to fix this. So we want to have better curriculum, we want to have better pedagogy, meaning better transmission. Even though like our schools talk individualized learning, is about learning at a different pace, but still comply with what I want to learn. This does not celebrate individual differences, doesn't do any of those things. So by now, the future will work. This is, again, this is a, a broken model that's right now happening a lot of places. University faces the same challenge, you know. When you prepare a major, you know, some, as a parent, you know, you send your kids to major in something. The whole major is called just in case courses. You know, you major in electric engineering, but a lot of times, by the time you graduate, those jobs are gone. Maybe those kind of things. So globalization and uh, the second machine age is really reevaluated. Now, I want us, forces us to rethink what matters in the future in our children's life. So this is somehow points up to some of the future talents. Number one is creativity. The creative group. Can you create things? Creativity is not only arts, only music. Creativity is everything. It's can you create new forms of ideas, of services, of products, of programs? Can you do that creativity? Creativity means originality. You know, you can be very creative in math, very creative in science, in, in biology, or you can, of course, creative in art. In every domain, you can be creative. Can you create? Our schools, the original model was not about creativity. It was about stifling creativity. Because creativity has been seldom useful, you know, for, for a long time. If you look at our schools, our traditional schools were not like children like this. Right? Because this kid, we would consider not ready for school, right? Because school is about homogenous, about stifling you. So that's, that, that's, that's why creativity for a long time was not talked about at all. I mean, like, uh, creativity as a concept appears only in books since after 1920s. This is from Google Books. If you go to Google Ingram, you can find the frequency of a concept, how how often it appears in the millions of Google books, you know, the digitized books. You can see that only appeared after 1920s and began to really surge after the 1980s when we entered the called the creativity column. It's, uh, and then, but if we have a lot of uh, mentions of children, if we type in children versus creativity, you can see we really, schooling has very little to do with creativity. We never talk about that. We never, only very recently we began to talk about creativity as important. You know what, in our uh, schools, most of the books we write in schools is about classroom management. It's about how to get rid of creative kids. It's, it's, uh, and we, we do a good job at uh, uh, stifling creativity. You know, when children come to our school, 
at age five, 98% of them are creative at the genius level. You know, that's not only creative, very creative at a genius level. So after getting five years in our school school, we got rid of 60% of them, but they're very good. You didn't do this. This is the primary school. Okay, you didn't do this. They're, they're wrong. Okay. Okay, so, so by the time they went to school, they already had this creative. So forget about it. It's not your fault. Okay. I told you, it's always blame somebody else. Okay. Now, but you still do a good job. So 60%, the, the time actually children lose creativity really around year three and year four. That's for the universal global, that we call a global fourth grade slump. And then, by the time they got to your school, they reached age 15, and 10% are left. This is a sharp, sharp decline. And then you finish university, because if you become a really good student, then you can get some jobs, you know, before, at age 44, we got 2% left. And then, but of course, you know, uh, there is hope after retirement. Frank, after retirement, creativity can bounce back. And as evidence, uh, uh, George Bush now is pending. Okay, if George Bush can regain creativity, you should be able to do that. Okay. And, uh, the, now, that, there's some other point beyond that. There's actually data shows something very interesting. Because creativity is not only cognitive, creativity is psychological. So when you teach creativity, it's not about how to be creative. Is you do you feel you are allowed? You are rewarded for being original. So you feel we learn not to become creative. And for this reason, the Asian systems, when you teach children to be homogenized, when you reward their behavior to answer questions, finding answers to a question on a test is the opposite of creativity. When, when they get in the habit of giving back answers back to you, they are losing creativity. So all the Asian systems, you know, they, they, are, they are very good at getting answers. You know, I was actually in Singapore, the same thing. They, 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 are, they were so proud because they just got uh, number one on the PISA problem solving. Problem solving, you know, uh, uh, test. They think it's great. Solving a problem, but actually I think that's not interesting. Now, solving a problem is still finding answers to something. I said, what's interesting, do you know which problem is worth solving? Or can you come up with a problem you want to solve? Did that people think this is great? This is, that's very different ideas about creativity. So it's emotional. And then we have to think about the other thing. So we talk about creativity as important. Can you make new things? Can you come up with new ideas? So this is one thing schools, how do you change that? That's not all. Remember schools, when you do curriculum, you also do another thing. So when we do the curriculum, we prescribe what talent and knowledge is valuable. When you include something, you exclude something. Do you notice that model? Is it the sausage making model? And that is that we like sausage, but if you're not sausage, we don't like you. We exclude you. That's the traditional model. Traditionally, we have to do that. Not many talents were valuable. When you both, you know, human beings have always been had different talents. But our societies could not enjoy the diversity of talents. I mean, you, you, great people like Kim Kardashian would be useless in that village. Remember, that, that's hard. That's hard to believe. So, so this next thing now, we have arrived, luckily, to the Kardashian economy, or we call the age of abundance, or the second machine age. What do we call it? We consume a diversity of talents. Now, you think Kardashian? Maybe it's useless. I can tell you other examples. Useless people, you would disagree with me. All the players in your Aussie team, the football team, the air force team, they're useless people. I mean, how much money they make to what they do? They produce nothing. I mean, you, you, like, think of, go back how many years, those guys would typically be your worst students, right? They kick people, they are violent, and they just, you know, they put them in jail. If they're useless people. All the sports stars, all sports stars, right? How do they become useful? Something very simple. Technology. Globalization, because now they can make huge events without cars. You cannot get the, 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 the football field. Without television, you cannot broadcast. Because they used to be, no matter, this is called the long tail phenomenon. No matter how strange your talent is, most of our talents cannot be appreciated by 100% of people. 
So it's always a small percent, maybe like 1%. So, but without technology, without globalization, 1% is based on maybe 10,000 people in your village, okay, in your, in your little place. If only 10,000 people can access you, but only 1% of 10,000 can access you, that's not enough. But as suddenly if you enlarge the base because of technology, because of globalization, to a billion people, that 1% is a lot. Therefore, crazy people like Lady Gaga, like Kim Kardashian, like Justin Bieber, have become valuable. So that's the first thing you remember this list is that we live in a globalized market. Your children, your students, your school, no matter how strange they are, I can assure you they can find someone stranger than them on the internet. <laughs> you can probably do the same. So do not ignore or neglect those individual talents. There's another thing that we also create, we today we create spiritual products. Necessity has nothing to do with our life anymore. We don't consume necessities. In my village, we consume necessities. Food, shelter, and clothing. In now, in developed countries like Australia, we consume psychological products. And psychological products are diverse. Your necessities are homogenous. You only have your need shelter, you need the food, you need clothing. But that's what physiologically, all human beings are very much the same. But psychological products are very different, are very diverse, because we desire different things. For example, uh, you know, the largest commodity in one category in most developed countries is choice. Choice, okay? And uh, give you an example of choice. I live in China, I moved to America in 1992. I went to a place, tried to buy something to wash my hair, couldn't buy it because I did not know what kind of hair I had. <laughs> Did you know that? You had no what hair you had? It kind of normal, oily, dry. I had to go hire a hair consultant for that. Right? <laughs> now, in your life, examine yourself. Not only shampoo, how many different brands? Do you really know the difference? I mean, in my village in China, I just had to wash myself. I had one bar of soap for everything. And that was fine, no problem. I didn't, you know. But now today, look at, I think some of the ladies, you have uh, something wash every inch of your skin. You have left ears, different right ear. I don't know why you're doing that. <laughs> but did you ever look? So you look around this list of psychological products. How many TV channels? How many musicians that we, we, we enjoy? And uh, uh, the clothing, even food has become, uh, go to Flinders Lane. Remember those, those restaurants, you go there? Really, the more money you pay, the less food you get. It's, it's, uh, so what are you consuming? You're consuming something really different. Since human beings are very diverse, we have different appreciation for different things, therefore a diversity of talents is valuable. So that means everybody is very valuable. We do not predetermine what children should know, we should look at their strength. So that's the second element. The third element in all of this is this idea of entrepreneurial thinking. It's entrepreneurial thinking. That is, students, now today we prepare them to, we prepare them to look for jobs, but jobs disappear. The only job you can be sure of is the one that you create. It's jobs go around globally, jobs changes all the time. Just over the past 10 years, you perhaps noticed how many jobs disappear and how many professions emerge. That's something. And because we created this, it's uh, who had that would have anticipated Twitter and and uh, Facebook, all those kind of things. You would there be a new profession, a new major uh, profession is called uh, social media managers. You know, they never existed before. We call now search engine optimizers. You probably don't even know what that is. That basically helps you your website to be better search. That, that's new jobs. All this create new things. And uh, speak of that, you look at uh, this. How many people have made money by making iPad, iPhone covers? Do you, do you know this? There's all new opportunities. New. And these people are what we call entrepreneurs. People who take advantage of new opportunities instead of trying to find existing professions. They're trying to find new ones. They are, they are called entrepreneurs. They are business entrepreneurs start with new ideas. They have social entrepreneurs who are trying to save the forest or something else we call it, the social impact. You have entrepreneurs who work within organizations. We got, by the way, we have so many people unemployed, 
We have so many jobs unfilled because companies are looking for a different kind of worker. They're not looking for employees. They're looking for entrepreneurs. Apple Computer says, if you want to be managed, you are not employable. That's what Apple's slogan is. They will be part of entrepreneurs that's in the political sector, the private sector, public sector, and nonprofit organizations. We all need entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs have different qualities. That's why the rise of the non-cognitive skills, the rise, the confidence, uh, the social networks, uh, risk-taking, passion, great, all of this have been traditionally ignored. Because tradition is, well, you're not accountable for this. You only worry about children's social and emotional wealth before when they interfere with their academic achievement. You know this? If the kid is not doing well, maybe he's depressed. No, today the non-cognitive skills, personalities, qualities like this are valuable in themselves as to drive the entrepreneur thinking. So it's three things, creativity, diversity of talents, and entrepreneur thinking. The traditional model of school damages those things. You know, when you, the more successful you are at sausage making, the more successful you are at getting rid of those other talents and get rid of creativity, and get rid of the non-productive skills. So to move forward, I have a proposal. I don't have enough time to finish this. I did not give me one hour, but anyway, so forget it. I don't expect this stuff. Now, so what we need to do, we need to shift. We need to shift our new paradigm of education. I think you, in Victoria, this is where we need to create. We need to create an iPhone paradigm. Not fixed in Nokia. That's how we started. So what would the new paradigm be? The new paradigm is that we do not prescribe what's valuable. We assume everything is valuable. If a Kim Kardashian is useful, anyone can be useful. Okay. Take that idea. I think education is about enhancing individual strength, not fixed or deficit. It is not about making a prediction who will have a job? It is about helping them create a new job. They will do it. And they, we, there are so many problems that can be solved and need to be solved. We need our students to solve this. Our university students do the same thing. So how do we do this? I suggest. <laughs> so the minister gave me so much autonomy. You can do this, actually, now. Uh, now uh, and he gave me so much money. You can do this. Now, number one, I think we need to rethink Curriculum as personalized education experiences, not as imposed upon prescriptive skills or knowledge. So if, because this is what distinguishes you from Shanghai, from other countries. If with $100,000, you can do this. With $10,000, you cannot do this. This is basically if a child comes to a school, follow his or her passion and interest. Support that. That's a truly a student autonomy, personalized idea. Can you do that? If, do you have that just for a student strength profile and how to support that strength? That's cost money, cost thinking of doing those. Second thing is that we have this technology. This is very near 10 years. Universal access to human information and communication anywhere, anytime is very recent, 10 years. Remember this thing? But that can change our teaching, pedagogy. You know, uh, you're going to talk about pedagogy. Pedagogy should be no longer just in case knowledge transmission should be just in time product making. If you want a child to be creative, you have to be follow his or her passion, but also make sure he or she is disciplined in making. They have to practice in making products and services from the get-go. They have to learn about how to meet other people's needs. A good entrepreneur is basically someone who betters their life by helping others. So do, do your children, your kindergarten, and you don't teach kindergarten, your ninth graders, do they know why they're good at something? Who cares about their strength? Do, are they making something that matters all the time? Do they know how to understand other people's needs? Because all this year when you're giving them the need. Just come to school, get an A, go home, you'll be happy, you know, and you'll be, no, 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 we should practice how to become great. Creativity without discipline is useless. Creativity without not, not out of knowledge is useless. They have learned to be disciplined. But also creativity is domain specific. You cannot be creative in everything. That's why it has to be personalized. And the final thing called the context of learning has to be global as campus. 
You organize your school as a global enterprise. Your students can learn truly from anywhere, from any, from anyone. So my my suggestion is that students can learn with, from, and for everybody anywhere. To this technology can do that. You do not have to own a language teacher to offer Mandarin language. You do not have to you know, own a fashion designer to teach fashion design. There's a lot of schools in Melbourne, in this area, in Victoria, is doing this. I mean, I don't know if I say the names, they're getting embarrassed. You got to find out who's doing some cool stuff. You don't know. I know there's a lot of things happening. So there's three elements: personalized education experience, product-oriented learning, which is different from project-based learning, and a globalized campus. So to do this, I know you know you want to know how to actually make this happen. It can happen. It has happened. Just you know, read my book. That's going to help you solve the, the problem. And uh, all this book is captured all everything here. And so, just to to summarize, you do not want to continue to make Nokia. It's time to make the iPhone. Okay. It's time to think about a driverless car arriving. I think our last time our education faced a massive shift. Was a hundred years ago. It's time to do this, and this time is serious. It's not, it's not about the how; it's about the what. We need to rethink about the whole idea about what kind of qualities that our children should have. So, to me, creativity, entrepreneur spirit, and their unique talents, capitalized in the globalized campus, will help. Thank you very much.